Hello, everybody, and welcome to this discussion, which I am very much excited about for a whole host of reasons. Many of you will go back with me uh, and my guest today, Gregory Rodriguez, who I think is just a brilliant essayist and, and amazing, if undiscovered, observer of American culture and identity. Uh, all the way back to our days of Americanada, about three or four years ago, we had started this venture together to kind of talk about American culture, where America was three, four years ago, uh, how it got there, the origins of what was happening to this country at a really tumultuous time. And the feedback was really exceptional, um, but life being what it does kind of moved us both in different directions. Um, I've come across a book that Gregory has written that is now in its second printing. And I, I've tweeted about this a little bit, but this book is called Whiteness, an American Tragedy. And it, it's, a, it's a book of about five essays, I think. I'm, I was going over this again last night that really encapsulates I think, <clears throat> this concept of, of whiteness that is um, it's not uniquely American, but it's uniquely ish American. <laughs> We're going to talk about what whiteness in America it's is. It's uniquely American. But that's it is good. uniquely American. Yeah, thanks for, the, for jumping in there. But uh, you know, Gregory and I just just for a quick way of background, and then I'll I'll, I'll shut up and we'll get into this conversation because I think you're really going to enjoy it. I'm really looking forward to it. Gregory and I have known each other for about 25 plus years now, um, and and back then I, I came across Gregory because he was writing this really remarkable stuff uh, in some of the major publications in the country, and I just picked up the phone at the time. This was before you know we all had pocket phones and and found this guy and called him. And he had the uh, he had the temerity to call me back, which I appreciated. And we started this discussion, and that discussion has turned into a, a many decades long friendship, uh, based in a whole lot of things. But but one of those being, this guy's really really intelligent, and he's really has a keen understanding and a passion for understanding um, America and what what it is and what it means, how it got here, where it's going, all of its peculiarities. And I learned so much from him every time we talk, and I've been saying that for 30 years, and I look forward to all of our conversations. And I'm glad, Gregory, welcome first to this conversation, but also thank you for um, for, for allowing me to kind of record this and share this with friends, because I'm really excited about grateful. this book. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So so the, the, this book, again, um, and and, and it, look, you, you guys have, have seen me plug it. I'm going to plug it a few more times, because I think it's really important to understand uh, where we're heading. It's it's called Whiteness, uh, an American Tragedy and Other Essays. Find it on Amazon. Um, and we'll put the link here on the show. But but I'm, I'm just going to start poking you with questions here, Gregory. And you, you I want this to be really conversational. So if I'm missing right. something, go where you need to go with it. But what, what, <clears> started, <throat> what started your journey down feeling the need to understand and examine what whiteness is? Well, the... the, the Deeper than my need to understand whiteness was my need to understand. Let me let me step back. Uh, my goal in life as a as a college student, I studied religious studies, uh, in, 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 a, 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 a subject, a, a major that no longer exists at UC Berkeley, by the way. And my interest was in culture, an American culture. And what about the culture? Does it sustain its people? Why is there so much suicide? Why is there so much homicide? What about this culture feels so unnurturing to so many people? And my, my interest was in American, the emptiness in American culture. And what I'd been doing for the last 20 years while I was busy trying to make a living through this hustle or that hustle, I had been developing, I'd been reading throughout. So I'd been reading about the emptiness of America for probably 12, 14 years. Um, I wanted to write a book about white people, but I also wanted to write a book about um, the essential emptiness of American culture, which I'm continuing to do, but I'm doing it through understanding liberalism, uh, philosophically liberalism, which is my next book. And but so my interest in, was really emptiness. And 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 as we we fell into the the uh, pandemic, it really struck me how empty the country was. And the, and the divisions between the states and the, the states and the federal government. And I suddenly saw America as a lattice work, 
as a la as essentially these squares and all these holes that you can fall through. And it suddenly struck me. And we remember we were we 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 talked a lot during that time. I had I was then hunkered down in Joshua Tree, California, thank God, and falling in love with all the animals. And I, I began to take all the research I had on emptiness and then funnel it through whiteness. And it became the same thing, in essence. I mean, there's other sources of emptiness to American culture, but whiteness being in its base, most basic sense, uh, the, 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 de the definition is of not being black, or as I've written one of these essays, not being Native American. My interest is really, what is this culture? Um, we think so much about white and not white, but no one, if you don't know what white means, how do you understand any of the other terms? And right. so I wanted to break down a fundamental term that we use daily and not really understand the origins of it. And by doing it, I started to understand the lattice work and how people group themselves in this country and what it means. And it, it really helps me a lot in, in learning how to survive that country, which I spend less and less time in, by the way. So, look, that's a great setup, and I love the metaphor of lattice work because it is easy to kind of slip through the cracks of of American society. It, in in large part, I think, as you're arguing, and we want to get deeper into because of this, either not not just a lack of culture, but but the <laughs> cultural anchors that we have are extraordinarily weak, and and we'll get into that uh, a little bit more if that's okay. But I, I I do want people to 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 think about for just a moment as we go through this conversation. The idea that, you know, we kind of almost, you know, dismiss this argument about this lack of American culture or what is American culture. And we kind of throw it away like it's just kind of a, a you know, a toss away term. But it, it, human beings really need a, a, an ethnicity and a culture to kind of connect them as, as a species, as, as human beings to, to themselves and to each other. And when we don't have that we start to see some very pernicious, so, some dangerous things happening to us as, 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 as beings. So I, I, this is a very smart point. I, I may or may not agree with you on the, the, what human beings need. I'm probably closer to agreeing with you. But liberal philosophy would say, no, they don't need it. What, 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 what people need is the ability to choose the group. And America does allow the choice but America was, uh, Jefferson among them, was about cutting from tradition, cutting from the past. There was an implicit anti-tradition, anti-religious. The, the enlightened was about using your head and to somehow, it assumed reason, assumed that somehow we can choose autonomy over all else. So what happens is over time as people shed, as you're implying, their backgrounds, and they don't find a new basis upon which to identify themselves or to, or to find security, then they fall through cracks. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, you do get the feeling that there is sort of middle class culture, Mike, which one could say allows for some mooring or some basic sense of how to behave. But beyond that, it's a shallow. It's a shallow basis of how to behave, but there is. But but but, but yes, we are talking about a society, and what does keep America together is more teleological. It's the meaning is found at the end. It's what keeps us together is the future, is the goal. So what keeps America together is what we hope to attain at the end, and the, we're running from the emptiness in order, in the hopes of gaining something. And is that, unique, what, is that uniquely American? I think it's very, very American um, that, that what keeps us together is the striving. Is the, is the, I mean, it, it's my understanding of Jeffersonianism is that go out and be selfish, go out and, 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 and command the continent, take whoever's land you need to do, and your victory, your gains are the nation's gains. In a sense, Americanism, is, as it was built, was, is very much an act of selfishness, of sort of enlightened selfishness, if you will, that it then, it then projected itself backwards onto the, your greatness became the nation's greatness. And so, no, so, the, so, the, so the basis became the hope. And that's very American. 
and, and so the, it's the basis of the greatness of America and, and, the, and the discoveries, uh, 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 the, the scientific and business is, but a lot of discoveries would not have happened if we'd had the comfortable base from which people were, that, that didn't lead people to run from, if that makes sense. It makes perfect emptiness sense. Propel, emptiness propels as well. And this is not a new concept is what, what I think you, you put lay forth in some of your earliest, your, the early part of the essays in this book. Your argument is this, be, this is the origin story, this running away, this, this leaving and seeking something new and something forward thinking. I don't know if it's aspirational. Maybe that's not the right word, but it's, it is. It's, it is right. There, there's this. There's this desire to get into a creaky old wooden boat and leave the shackles of Europe behind, and come for this religious or zeal, or Mexico or whoever. But or then, wherever. if you get to Philadelphia, or if you get to to San Diego, and you find new shackles, you leave those too. And when you think about, it, we talk about white flight, right? Mm -hmm. For instance, in the, in the post World War II years. Well, the whole country is white flight. <laughs> the whole country is flight from somewhere because the opportunities weren't there. And so, the, so the, the, the whole country is premised on the lack of absence of loyalty. It's, it's LeBron James leaving Cleveland, dude. It's, just, <laughs> it's you know, they are. So, so you're a, you're a, you're, you're, and look what they did to him in Cleveland, right? You're a traitor. You don't, you know, you don't love what's important. You're after money. It, it, it was a classic American story. You leave for what's better. And again, how do you build a society that's of social cohesion and love for one another when the message is get up and leave when things go bad? But that's also the beauty of it. Well, that, I was going to say that, and that's important. That It's not necessarily a criticism as much as it's an observation and an explanation. Everything I write about is not, I, I'm not coming out. I'm not, not judging it. Left with, no, I'm trying to understand this culture that's always, some of it is about trying to understand why I thought it was so, so much of it was so stupid or why I some of it I found oppressive. But just because I found it oppressive doesn't mean it's bad. But, but I really do try to see the pitfalls and what's extraordinary about it is I can, I can get into deep reading and say, oh, God, what a horrible country. And I land in Newark and there's millions of faces from all over the world and exciting and dynamic. And I say, son of a bitch, what a great country. So I do that all the time. Yeah. You know, I can see the benefits of European security, but I can also see I, I once I understand America, I see its beauty as well. But. Right now, I'm really trying to understand its, its emptiness. And the emptiness seems, and I don't know if it's unique to this time or if it's just magnified at this time, but this this hyper-individualism combined with or because of this lack of, of cultural centering has led us to a moment uh, which was particularly pronounced during the, the pandemic. And when you were writing a lot of these essays, you and I were talking for a couple hours a day, right? Like mm -hmm. you were isolated uh, where you were, I was isolated where I was, but we'd kind of start this ritual of talking and, and kind of you were chewing on these ideas. And I was like, wow, this is really fascinating. But you were seeing things like the, 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 the hyper individualism and this, this definition of freedom, which was literally becoming a danger to people and their own lives. That's why it was such a great moment to write about it. Go on, go on, yeah. And yeah. so, I, I, in, in the first essay, you, which you, which you call the glue and the fuel, um, I want, I want, I want to read a quick snippet, and I want you mm -hmm. to kind of react to it a little bit. You, you write when Alexis de Tocqueville worried about the corrosive influence of individualism on America, he wasn't worried about Americans. His concern was for the nation's young democracy. As he argued, democracy creates equality, which in turn creates individualism, which can lead to a kind of social vacuum in which despotism can take hold. Right. Wow. Say more and about that. In, in more, more recently, I've been reading about Tocqueville's <clears throat> strong belief that democracy, American democracy, could only survive with religion. Not for any supernatural or any reasons regarding God. 
he believed that religion created some semblance of restraint or at least ideologies of restraint in a country about the release of energy, in a country about the self. So, <clears throat> so what we're seeing in the, in the decline of religion and the decline of sort of restraint, we're seeing his nightmare come true on many levels. That, that he, he, again, he marveled at, the, at what he called individualism but he also feared what it could become. And so, so all of this was in the DNA of America, as you're applying, but it also, in the scientific era, in the post, you know, the, the God died in the, in, the, in the 19th century, not even in the 20th, that, that the unmooring of people from ethnic and religious backgrounds led people, again, many people to have, the, no longer have the wherewithal to survive life. And my concern in a country that is about, still largely about competition, is about duking it out and getting ahead. Um, getting lost in the United States is a very easy thing to do. And the inequality in the country is so great that people without, if you have people who are suffering, jobless or, or, or whatever, are, are homeless, who don't have a sense of how to behave, or, or, or ideologies or beliefs that help them move forward and survive to the next day, then you have what we have. You have a, a remarkably sad, chaotic, dangerous country full of really unhappy people. How could you not? Yeah, how could you not? And and you, you have cited numerous data points about mm -hmm. how we are suffering as a nation suicide rates, opioid addiction, um, uh, self-harm, obesity, which is kind of a form of it, uh, mass shootings. And you've also pointed out very accurately that, that the United States of America disproportionately suffers from all of these social afflictions. Absolutely. There's no semblance of, of, of there's, there's the, the, literally, if, if you take modern liberal viewpoints, not, not politically liberal, yeah, not yeah, democratic, right. look at, it is the belief in autonomy overall. And if you take that, and, and liberalism as, 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 gonna, as, a, as a political viewpoint of the belief in the, the primacy of the individual and the autonomy of the individual, it's a beautiful and necessary oppositional viewpoint. That you need that. That's how it arose. It, it arose against excesses of feudalism, excesses of the Catholic Church. But in the absence, liberalism needs, needs something to attach. It can't survive on its own. And that's where we are now. Without a, a foundational base of ethnicity or religion, liberalism is just saying everyone is free. Everyone be free. That's not a, that's not, freedom isn't an end of itself. Is that all? It's not, it's not happiness, it's not love, it's not cohesion, it's not the well-being of the collective good. No, we've reached it where liberalism without anything to moderate becomes sort of non-moderate itself, becomes excessive. And I learned that, this is one of the, one, we left LA for a variety of reasons, but one of it was uh, after a judicial decision that said it's more important for, 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 for a, a, a homeless person to be able to camp on a, on, a, on a sidewalk with no regard for the collective good, it was just striking. It was just striking. Like, I understand the need for rights. I believe in rights. But I also understand, like most Americans, the need for the common good. And when you see the, the belief in rights over the good, it, 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 when, you even, when you don't even believe in the common good, that's 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 what we have in places like California. In in my estimation, there is no belief in the common good. There's a and, belief and, in and you, that you, it, you, leads, it leads to just a breakdown of the social order and structure because dude, order. literally. So then the, the, the argument was, that, and I don't want to get into this too much, but the argument was that this is a biological necessity to sleep. Well, so is shitting and pissing. And so is it? And so you know, I, when I I didn't knew my senior lead officer when I lived in L.A. I, well, actually, no, we can't do anything if they shit and piss on your lawn. Then we're not going to. It is. It was San Francisco, L.A., Portland, Seattle, anything in the in the, in the Ninth Circuit was fully a breakdown of society, and because we saw the belief in rights over the good, fully and completely. 
the good did not, the collective good did not matter, does not matter anymore. And, and that's why we've seen a, 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 an inarticulate and stupid and angry rebellion. <laughs> right. Well, I, I don't, I won't wear a mask because it's my freedom, it's my right. It, that's tyrannical right. government making right. me wear a mask right. is this cartoonish response to this breaking down of the social order. Right. It's and it's it's not left or right. It's 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 American liberal viewpoint that freedom over all. And that that yeah, without that anchor, which Tocqueville would say would be religion, without without that as re, common racial strength. culture as as a as a framework, as the guardrails, the guardrails, then or you're gonna go you're going to go off the rails. So talk about the notion of a compromise or a notion of you can protect X people's rights while respecting the well-being of others. Rights there, at some really, point became an entitlement, right? There's no, there's, it's, 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 it's winner take all rights. And right. if rights are the only thing that matters, then, then that's where society we're, can't work. Whether it was the second amendment or on the right or other rights on the left, if rights are, matter more than anything else, then God bless you. <laughs> Let, let's let's. This is important because there there we are going somewhere with this. There is a nexus between that inevitability. You always get me to talk of things about. I don't want to talk about, but I love it. Go on. I know, that's why. That's why. I think you're, that's why I like spending time with you. Um, there's a there's a nexus between whiteness here. It doesn't sound like we're talking about whiteness, but we are. Yeah. This is this is the, the the racialized notion of whiteness is politically defined as much as it is the skin color of the people that we're talking about. Well, yes. Well, actually, it wasn't even out skin color initially, and I don't want to get too deep in the woods. With, with one of the striking things, but the first use of white people was 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 in Barbados and. And Barbadians came to South Carolina and they brought with them a slave system, a, a legal system that was set up by the British. And it essentially white people were the owner class and, and black people were the sl enslaved class. And the idea was that that in order to call everyone white, it, it kept the non-slave owner European origin person not joining slaves. Poor white Poor whites. It was a way. It was a top-down notion of whiteness to keep the non-slave owning white in alliance with the slave owners. That's what that was. That was the black-white definition. They were trying to prevent a class upheaval by by creating a racial commonality. Precisely. What I I, I I got into and 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 we even drove the length of, of Pennsylvania was there was a different emergence of whiteness. And it wasn't based on skin color per se, because it never included the damn Quakers who were who were. Who, so this this was the 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 diversity of European origin, uh, 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 Scotch Irish, English, uh, 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 Irish, uh, a variety of German groups of different different religious leanings, um, uh, 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 Quakers, and so as they as groups moved. European Americans moved westward, dis displacing more and more Native Americans, even initially with payments. Um, at a certain point, and I don't want to get too nerdy into it, the French backed Native American groups that had been so far pushed west, the French backed them with arms to attack the European Americans uh, under British rule that were pushing them westward. And that turned these variety of ethnic Europeans who never talked to each other, who had no love for each other at all, it turned them into white people. They became white people as refugees. And what brought them together, what helped them overcome their distrust and disdain for one another was their hatred of the Indian. So it was a victimhood and hatred that created whiteness on the frontier, which is a very, which was more of a horizontal whiteness rather than the vertical whiteness, uh, whiteness vis-a-vis -vis slavery. So you saw whiteness emerging on the Pennsylvania frontier as a, a victim identity that, but it did not include the Quakers 
because the Quakers were pacifists. The Quake, the, the, it was the one, one scholar thinks that Pennsylvania was the one colony in which the Native Americans had more guns than the Europeans because mm. they were pacifists. So the, the Scotch Irish particularly hated the Quakers. So it wasn't even racial per se. Because they fascinating. were fascinating. So it, and, and, and so and so so that's how it started in Pennsylvania. And to understand the mechanics of the emergence of whiteness as a victim identity, as a and, and by the way, once you're a victim, it justifies your depredations to those who victimized you. And not only can you kill them, you can take their land. So victimhood then became a force. With that and a justification for European Amer European Americans moving westward, taking Indian land. So American victimhood didn't start in the '60s. It was exacerbated and fed by by infrastructure, the civil rights infrastructure. But it began on the frontier with uh, European Americans. And do you see that correlation? Well, I see it was pretty cool. Was that? That's, that's 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 interesting stuff. I hope. Oh, it's fascinating. Well, that's what we're talking about. It. No, no, this is deeply fascinating. I was going to ask: Is there a correlation to what we're seeing today, where the fear is that brown people are invading the country and taking our stuff? No, that's not today. That's all the fear. I mean, no, it's it, yes, it's a court, but that's throughout. Okay, so. Take what you just said, the absence of a foundation, of an ethnic foundation, because the diversity didn't allow for that. And the way, the way religion was handled constitutionally was actually brilliant. It was like, hey, we can't afford to be Europe and we don't want to be Europe. So everyone's got to get along. So there can't be an established religion. Brilliant, right? So that then doesn't lead. From, so that led to whiteness being a loose affiliation. Loose affiliations don't feed people. Loose affiliations constantly need an external enemy to right. cohere. Look at and, and look. You, you look at the history: the, the 9/11, Pearl Harbor, the Alamo. Think of how many victim moments. The most powerful country in the history of the world nurtures these notions of victimhood to cohere, and that is because it's not an ethnically based country. It requires enemies more than others all 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 identities require external pressure but i think america is more addicted to it than others because of the absence of an internal cohesion so is whiteness then identified by what it's not more than what it is precisely precisely it's it it, 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 it and therefore it actually doesn't even tell you much about the person I mean, <laughs> right. And I, th I think we're, we're growing more aware of that as whites are shrinking as a share of the population. Would you agree with that? Yes, because they're acting more and more like minorities. Right. So, so everyone's a minority. And yet, why can't they? Since we haven't never defined the word minority, are women minorities? Well, actually, no, they're the majority. So minority doesn't mean anything. It's just some totally abused word. Um, and About establishing your victimhood in this society that I'm so, some, some level, level of oppressed. Yeah. The next book I'm working on is is what, where the word began used in treaties after World War One, mm -hmm. and you know, and understanding the use of uh, of the word minority in, in late FDR and uh, administration. So, literally understanding the emergence of that language throughout the 20th century, and so that's what I'm doing now. I'm trying to understand the emergence of the language. And now it's just used however willy nilly. Now and now we've seen this perverse level of using everything for an advantage. You know. So there has to be, as a as a as a nation, as a people, a deep insecurity about who we are. If you can articulate your oh. cohesion only by what you're against and not by what you're for. Damn it, dude! You're so good. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that's why we need we need enemies. We fell apart after the Soviet Union fell. And that we fell apart as well. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. The United yes. States fell apart. Yeah. 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 And that that I think is one of the lessons of the kind of the post-Cold War era is you know, we were looking at politically, the, the, the political lines of countries fell apart, but culturally we didn't mm -hmm. we didn't have an external boogeyman that we desperately required 
to, to focus our energy efforts and, and, and aspirations towards, we needed to beat something. We need to conquer something. We needed and, to move and, towards and suddenly, something. And the, and, and suddenly we won. And what is we, and what did those Eastern Europe countries who became like we did, what did, what do we, that's what I'm working on now. What do, what did they win? Who are we? What are the advantages of this system? I'm reading this weekend, I'm reading Richard Rorty, an essay, you know, in which he, the philosopher, American philosopher, in which he's essentially saying the liberal democracy kind of creates crass, mediocre people and culture, but it's the price we pay for the level of political freedom we have. It doesn't, <laughs> certain types of people are created by certain types of systems, and ours is not creating real stellar ones, except. Well, well, you can leave it. You can leave it that. But go on. Well, it's a tough one to just stop and hit hit a, hit a, hit the end of the road there and leave me with that. I mean, I just go like a wildly coyote skidding before I went off the cliff. So, so what? I, so, so let's let's talk about how this manifests socially a little bit more, so we we can take it from sort of the abstract to kind of the the specifics here. In 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 your second essay. You, you you referenced the work of, of of sociologist Mary Waters, right? Who finds that the, the symbolic ethnicity, and again, the whiteness is this, this symbolic ethnicity, which I think is a fascinating you know sort of concept that gives whites quote a feeling of community and special status as an interesting right. or unique individual, right? The idea of being just white doesn't give people a sense of membership in one large family, the way that right. being French does for people in France. Right. Talk more about that. So, so, so again, whiteness, again, my, my primary interest, and let me just go back really quickly. My, I, when I was 19, I wanted to be a theologian. I went to the, the I went, I wasn't raised non-religiously. Uh, I went to an anti-religious school at UC Berkeley and I studied Latin and German <laughs> and I didn't get to become what I wanted to do. Now I'm doing what I've always wanted to do, which is to study the culture that I grew up in, right? Mm -hmm. And and so 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 the 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 question here that Mary Waters is is really asked: Does this white identity nurture its members? If that's the if that's the word, and it doesn't. And what she found in this brilliant ethnography is that then once people so so let's let's say an Italian American or Irish American uh, in 1905 felt discrimination, uh, was was kept from jobs, was kept from moving into certain neighborhoods, and and they then, as was encouraged by society at large and by their own interests, backed away from their Irishness or their Italianness, so that their children could have a greater access to the benefits of the broader society, and so their grandchildren. Uh, I think I, in the book I use something about the, the Greek Americans, you know. So they, they move out from the ethnic enclave, but by the time you've reached whiteness, you're lonely. You're, you have no particular specialness. And what the, the Waters book called Ethnic Options, I believe, that, uh, she's a Harvard sociologist, um, it, it says that then whites begin to then uh, uh, attach themselves onto the very identities their grandparents moved their families away from because there was no longer a discriminatory cost to it. You know, there's no... You got all the, all the good of it. All the, the food, the flag, the memory, the nostalgic memory without having to confront the sign saying no dogs or Irishmen need right, to lie. Right, exactly. I, I would then say, and there's a other, this is also in one of the essays, then by the, by the late 60s and 70s, you started to see whites um, grab onto Latino. I know white journalists in Los Angeles who like to think they're Latino right. and makes them say, you know, you know um, without ever having been discriminated against, without anybody ever having assuming who they were or what they wanted or what their characters were. Um, so then African American, and so the, the identities. Uh, for what for for lost whites become the anchors that you're saying we we don't have. So it wasn't even just nurturing latent identities. Now it's borrowing all sorts of identities to make yourself feel special in a society in, in a in a in a society with no mooring, with no anchor. 
That's fascinating because I mean I go through my career too, and, and I, I saw I don't mean I don't mean to make this so crass, but I saw this a lot in the Republican Party where someone would say, "Well, my grandmother was Hispanic, so I'm Hispanic now." <laughs> it never occurred to you until you could leverage that ethnicity in this kind of oppression model to say, "Well, I too, I too, having faced none of that, none of that at all." Right. Suddenly, people are, ident- are 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 seeking in the political structure to kind of right. find this quote unquote you know oppression. Uh, I, I, I want to go somewhere with that too, though, because right. Mary Waters also says a lot of her respondents in her study implicitly understood that American was a political or national identity and not a cultural or ethnic one. Right. And that's uh, is American whiteness. I would say no. I think we were sophisticated enough to know that it's a civic identity, but whites have been shown through many polls to show they often identify more with it as a military or economic structure. Uh, 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 uh. So no, I, I, I think uh, I think we know that it's a civic identity, um, and, it, 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 and and this is not. But this, when I talk about whiteness, it's not. Exc- the emptiness of whiteness isn't exclusive to whites. That that the notions that the, the if, what I personally have lost as a third and fourth generation Mexican American from the success of my parents or the success of my generation is considerable. There is Amer- becoming American is a sense of loss, not just for European origin Americans, but there, there is this idea. There is, but this is also this is also. This new work I'm working on, which is the absence, the, the loss of provincialism, the loss of regional accents, the loss of, of particularism to become a Stanford grad or an Ivy League grad leaves one into this ethereal class of unrooted people. So going up the ladder, African-Americans experience the same thing which is that, that, that one is taught that to get ahead, one must lose certain behaviors that may threaten whites, that may, th- that, that may be used against you. I've been told not to use my hands so much since I was in third grade. Mm-hmm. Oh, don't speak up. Oh, oh, Greg, now tell, don't tell me what you really think. Like, I can be misinterpreted in a way that someone smaller and less brown than me wouldn't. So, so there are all sorts of incentives to deny I mean, that's, you know, you know, me and the, the term Latino and Hispanic. I don't like it because my, my grandparents didn't come from Hispanic Landia. I'm Mexican American. Specificity gives you meaning. Hmm. The, the, the generic qual the generic words we use are for government legibility. Those are for governments to count people. It's the same reason we use inches or pounds. It's a way to uniform, to make uniform all sorts of measurements. And we use those as if they're identities. They're not. They're amalgamated government issued identities that leave us, once again, feeling unspecial. Go back to the very unspecial and unrooted. You're seeing this through globalism. You're seeing in Spain here, you're seeing the need for the specific regional identity. Um, so, yeah, I think, I, so, so it's not, I just, my book is really, again, it's about white because it's the most it's the most extreme example of the phenomenon, but it can happen to anybody. How many Asian Americans I went to college with? They, how their their parents' language is it's not their strong point. <laughs> right. It's be, becoming American is a process of becoming a loss for the hope of a gain in the end. And is that you whiteness? Know? What's that? Is that you know? whiteness? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't characterize it's. It's. It's the promise of America. The promise. Of America. The hope it's of America. America. America's all. America is promise. America is the future. Which I think, you, as you also write, is why it's so disappointing, right? Yes, but that's a Samuel Huntington line. He says that doesn't mean it's not true. No, it yeah, mean- it's, it's not a judgment. It's, if, yeah. you're, if you're if if the, what you're selling is hope, I mean you can't that the, the, a, a a byproduct, not always, but a byproduct is going to be the inevitability of disappointment. You, you know the 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 book I really wanted to write in that's what you'll never do in the 2000s was hope as a compensatory ideology. That it's really that you, without hope, America is a shark. 
If it doesn't move, it dies. So, so it's really like any other culture is sense, even living in Spain is a circular quality to the days and to the weeks and to the months. And it's so soothing to me because I can tell when it's a holiday because it's quiet outside because it's unlike Los Angeles when there's 87 holidays. You know, I mean? you don't know which school district has the week off. Everything, there's a, there's a certain uniformity that's comforting, but there it's just the meaning is what might happen. That's why you do it. And for some of our families, it worked, not, not without loss, not without cost. But for too many people, the country does not deliver. And what did they give up in order just to end up on a street? Mm. There yeah. is, there is an, America is an exchange. It's a transaction. There is, and it can be gloriously fulfilling for many. And it can work for many. But the law, I remember this little kid, I met this kid on the block when I was a kid. And, and he, he went his name, I asked his name, he called himself Jimenez instead of Jimenez. Hmm. My father, who was a college Spanish professor, said, Poor little bastard. <laughs> he felt bad for him. Yeah. I, yeah. I do too. A little heartbreaking to hear that too. Just that. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and not that it's right. I'm not even, I'm not condemning him as a person. It's, no. What else have you lost about the potential meaning your life could derive from what your grandparents knew? Hmm. What do we lose? What do we gain? And that's scary when you look at America that, and it's also, again, Entirely dynamic and hopeful and great. Yeah. Let's shift now to uh, my favorite essay, which is uh, America's First Karen. <laughs> I love the title there. It's a great well, story. It's a little bit different. Her. From, that's her that's on the cool. cover. That's Karen. That's her with the finger pointing. And if you look at the back of the book, she has a hatchet ready to take your head off. Walk, tell us the story. How did, how did you come to write America's dude, First Karen? Dude, the white I heroine at, who legitimized racial aggression. It's a great chapter. I great was essay. at my former favorite L.A. steakhouse, which is no longer uh, the Pacific Dining Car. And a hostess at the time was leading me to a table. And we got to talking. And she told me she was a descendant of this woman who became centuries as a Puritan woman who had been attacked and her children attacked and killed by Native Americans. Um, what's, it's a horrible story and she then escapes. What happens then is centuries later, she became, she became the first woman ever to be honored with a statue in the United States of America. So she became an emblem and again, a justification for conquest of Indians because she was a memory of a victimized woman who herself used it, hatchet. Um, so literally within weeks, this was, I, I did this many years ago, actually. Um, I got in a car and I, and I flew actually. And I, 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 I went to Haverhill, Massachusetts where this statue is. And I went to another statue in New Hampshire where she's holding, um, I, won't, I won't find it, where she's holding a, a, she's clasping um, um, scalps. scalps. There, can you see the scalps? She's holding. Yeah, perfect. A scalps like it's like, like their bouquet of flowers. So, so again, the use of a victim female to justify aggression and even taking away the property or both against Native Americans. That, that came centuries later as a legitimizing concept, which, which we've seen with African Americans. We've seen white women's suffering used against non-whites since the nation was born. I go back in another essay, and there was an actual predecessor to this. Well, no, actually, no, Anna Dustin was first. Jane McRae. It was a, it's a famous painting, The Death of Jane McRae, who was attacked by Native Americans uh, and turned into a, a American revolutionary war cry. Remember Jane McRae. So it was the victimization of white women at the hands of Native Americans um, that became a justification for aggression 
and stealing of Native American property. That's all pretty freaking straightforward, actually. There's nothing really, there's nothing really uh, hidden about it. It's just there, and it's still there. Yeah, and I just think it's profound that the, the that you know the country decides that the first woman that they're going to honor with a statue is, is re, you know, is I, I look the, the, the <clears throat> what happened to her is horrible, right? She had her own children taken from her and mass. Of course, but, absolutely. But the, the 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 celebratory or the honoring of her holding scalp Indian scalps right becomes this justification and the way she's even dressed in the statue you point out in the essay yeah. leads to this sort of very feminine great the implication that she but 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 again this was probably I don't know if it was a country these are probably communities that created these 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 honors. Um, but it's it's but all countries devise ideologies to further its gain. And one of the one of the striking things if I can go backwards was on the Pennsylvania frontiers, Europeans and Native Americans and in middle in much of the country got along when there was a balance of power. They exchanged goods, they helped each other, they were neighbors on the they intermarried. But th this middle ground is what a great scholar at Stanford called the call. The, 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 that ended when European Americans then wanted. It, it, it's, it's like it's like Gaza, which we won't get into, and Israel isn't a religious battle; it's a territorial battle. That essentially ideal and racism is generally used to justify interests. The taking of interest. Mm -hmm. we, we've ruined it and talk about it. it's a feeling. Be kind. It's nice. Don't say X word. It's not about words. It's about interest. And we made it about love. No, no, no. Love is not does not fix racism. Is justification for group interests that one group wants what another group has. And the European Americans wanted the land, so they needed to create ideologies to justify the taking of the land. And that's what these statues were. They just, we do it all the time. We do it with we do it with the killings in in Georgia recently. We we turn victims and again. We're not denying that they were victims, as you rightly said, but we turn them into uh, an martyrs. Order. we martyrs in order to justify revenge. Just mm -hmm. plain and simple. Do not to to actually glorify revenge. To go that's. Yeah, it's what's happening? Yeah, like you just said, with in the current debate in Georgia right now, yeah. the undocumented mm -hmm. asylum. So, so then, go ahead. No, no. So let's let's fast forward to the nineteen twenties, if we can, the Progressive Era, right? The end of the Progressive Era and the rise of the Immigration Reform Control Act of the nineteen twenties. The Teddy Roosevelt. You know, as the first president who kind of gets out there and says, being a hyphenated American is not being an American at all. Right. Right. And he begins this this process, which I, I think was probably relatively unique in America's history to that point, which was, right. was this explicit argument that you had to leave your race, ethnicity, religion, culture at the shores of America to, to come become this, you know, quote unquote, American, right. this, this new nation we were building. And if you if you hold on to the that baggage, you're 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 a detriment to the country. Essentially, you're yeah, an anti-American, and it was essentially a, a complete nightmare. That essentially, but the, the the country was so big that ethnic settlements could survive throughout the 19th century. Um, I think the, the, the islands of ethnicity. I forgot what the Robert Weaver historian called them. But as the country became more urban, as the country began to industrialize, there were those like Roosevelt who believed there needed to be a uniformity, again, the uniformity of the country. So the, the, the America had allowed it. The, the, I, I put in one of the essays uh, the, the extent to which German lasted in, in, in Wisconsin. So, but, so, yeah, Roosevelt essentially demonized. The, he said that you can't be hyphenated and be American. And this was not this was not uh, done or said or promoted without uh, without some opposition. Uh, another, and I, and I won't waste my time looking at it, but there is this. Um, there were those arguments that what are you doing? You're taking away 
anchor, mooring, identity, and you're leading people into the, the I, I, I don't think, the, but maybe the word was to swim in the detritus of, 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 of American culture. And so it was, it, it, and I'm not sure I was fair to blame Roosevelt because it, perhaps it was inevitable to happen anyways in an urbanizing country, but it became the ideological endorsement of a type of assimilation that did not help a lot of European Americans that led to the nostalgia of their grandchildren. Um, it, it was a particularly, uh, uh, it, 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 again, I'm talking about, I'm not writing a book about what's good about for America. What was good for, was this good for people? Human beings. What's good for an individual and a family to know that they had to deny their ethnicity. And most people, by the way, even in the, in the waters and other all sorts of surveys, find what's special about themselves. Whether, however assimilated they are, they'll say, what's special about them? Oh, it's my Swedishness. I'm a hard worker because I'm blank. Most people find some way to give honor to specificity of the past or present to make them special. Um, and, and, and what Roosevelt did was sort of lead us toward this uniformity that we're still struggling with. This country who talks a huge game about diversity doesn't really believe in diversity. That's ideologically, American newspapers go through from A to B. Um, it's, it's striking how narrow and what's accepted in America is this much. And, and I think Roosevelt probably started down that path of being very, very narrow culturally and ethnically and, and ideologically and intellectually. What's what are you allowed to say at an American university in 2024? Right. And that so most so much you would argue that so much of our social affliction, so much of what we're dealing with is <clears throat> and you're not blaming him. You're saying it's inevitable that this this unfolding was ultimately going to happen. But so much of what what whiteness and Americanness is suffering through right now is it's realizing it's so hollow and it's so empty that it can't navigate through modern the modern world. Yeah, and the country can't model that. Yeah, I mean, again, it's it, it, we, what we suffer from is essentially emptiness, the violence and the drugs and the despair. It's a it's a very sad country. Is it fixable? Where does this all go? You're you're the you're you're always the pragmatic person. I I, I don't think I think it's in the DNA. Uh, I think um, I check this out. I sat next to an Amish man on an airplane from Jackson, Wyoming to uh, Chicago O'Hare three weeks ago. And my sense is that his unwillingness to assimilate into so much of America, the detritus of American culture, preserves his sanity and pres preserves his family. More and more, I'm understanding the resistance to the emptiness means pulling back from it and not assimilating into it. Um, that, that's a, right what conservatives are doing by not selling their children to school. Um, this is what people did in the 70s and the, the left did in the 70s by you know, dropping out and not being part of it. I, in a way, I think America, in its most glaring into the sun sense, is something you want to hide from. I think the answers become are developed by individual families and churches. How do you preserve some sort of sense of ritual and 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 circularity and meaning and and depth, um, or be eaten up, eaten alive by by the emptiness? The book you're making me sound bleak, dude. Well, that's you, not me. <laughs> <laughs> the book is called Whiteness and American Tragedy and Other Essays by uh, the brilliant essayist and social observer Gregory Rodriguez, who's also uh, one of my dearest, closest friends. Is there anything that we've missed, Gregory, that you want to add to the discussion here, or do you think we kind of got most of it? I, I, you, you always come out. I don't know if we got most of it, but... Again, I, I, I mean, just go back and say something. I don't want to end on a bleak. Being bleak and being negative doesn't help anybody, really. Um, 
is that so much of the vitality of the culture still remains, but there is this, there is this, this, this there is this, 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 the fight to control the narrative is so striking and the unwillingness to let people be and to think the narrowness. And right now I'm talking about the left at this point, the narrowness of acceptability of what you can say, how to behave, that's not freedom. So freedom can't, I don't, I don't mean, I'm not a right winger. I don't mean to sound like a right winger. And I, but, but, the, but, but notions of pushing back on the narrowness of left and right and to create more room to be free, to create more room away from the emptiness, um, is the only way people are going to fight. I, I just, I think the country needs, I actually think the country's not feeling like a free country to me. There needs to be a, a reassertion or an assertion of the virtue of nonconformity. Again, a pushback. Thank you. Yes. And not only that, the, the, and it's hard to do in a, in, in a country dominated by corporations. How do you how do you how do you reinvigorate the sense of individual democracy and participation of what really matters as a corporation? So yeah, the, the conformity in America is is, is breathtaking. Um, yeah, conformity, uh, the, the nonconformity, and 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 do it your own way. And just like, but how how do you escape Apple? How do you escape my computer? How do you escape it now? We've scaled. On, uh, and mass so much of our lives that you can't get off the grid anymore. And democracy was an experiment in not being on the grid. American American democracy. Well, that's that's a beautiful statement. Let's let let's end it there. <laughs> I love being the optimist because it's such a rare thing for me. But Gregory, as always, I, let's do this more. Let's do this more because right, I miss our I conversation. Really your time. Yeah, and I love sharing it with uh, with the world. So um, again, Thanks, one man. final plug here. The book is Whiteness and American Tragedy and Other Essays. You can find it on Amazon. You've got, a little bit, uh, you've got Karen on the front, the America's First Karen, Hatchet on the back, uh, Signed in Blood by Gregory if you want to on Amazon or eBay. I think those are on eBay. So find, us, <laughs> find it on Amazon. Enjoy it. Give me your feedback. Thanks again so much for being with us, and we will talk at a later date. Thanks, bud.